Keep her gloves on. Oh, we're splitting. Keep your gloves. We know we'll do so. If upon our train she stumbled on one's train, one's always treading. If her hair is rather tumbled, still it will be a pretty wedding. Such, such a pretty, pretty wedding. Such, such a very, very pretty wedding. Would it be a pretty wedding? Would it be a pretty wedding? Such a pretty, pretty wedding. Such a pretty wedding. Such a tall. At a time, I beg, uh, let me understand the situation. As solicitor to the conspiracy to dethrone the Grand Duke, a conspiracy in which the members of this company are deeply involved, I am invited to the marriage of two of its members. I present myself in due course, and I find not only that the ceremony has taken place, uh, which is not of the least consequence, but the wedding breakfast is half eaten, which is a consideration of the most serious importance. But the ceremony has not taken place. We can't get a parson. Can't get a parson? Why, how's that? They're three a penny. Oh, it's the old story, the Grand Duke. <laughs> It seems that the little imp has selected this our wedding day for a convocation of all the clergy in the town to settle the details of his approaching marriage with the enormously wealthy Baroness von Krakenfeld. And there won't be a parson to be had for love or money until six o'clock this evening. And as we produce our magnificent classical revival of Troilus and Cressida tonight at seven, we have no alternative but to eat our wedding breakfast before we've earned it. So sit down and make the best of it. Oh, I should like to pull his grand ducal ears for him, that I should. He's the meanest, the cruelest, the most spiteful little ape in Christendom. Well, we shall soon be freed from his tyranny. Tomorrow the despot is to be dethroned. Hush, rash girl, you know not what you say. Oh, don't be absurd. We're all in it. We're all tiled here. That has nothing to do with it. Know ye not that in alluding to our conspiracy without having first given and received the secret sign, you are violating a fundamental principle of our association. 
I, the mystic regulation of the dark association, ere you open conversation with another kindred soul, you must eat a sausage roll. You must eat a sausage roll, a sausage roll. If in turn he eats another, that's a sign that he's a brother. Each may fully trust the other. It is quaint and it is drunk, but it's bilious on the whole. Very bilious, very bilious on the whole. It's a greasy kind of pastry, which perhaps a judgment hasty might consider rather tasty. Wants to speak without disguise, it's found favor in our eyes. It's found favor, it's found favor in our eyes. When you've been six months feeding, as we have on this succeeding bilious food, it's no ill breeding if at these repulsive pies our offended gorges rise. Yes, these repulsive pies, our offended gorges rise. Our gorges rise, our gorges rise. By the mystic regulation of the dark association, ere you open conversation with another kindred soul, you must eat a sausage roll. A sausage roll, a sausage roll, a roll, a roll, a sausage roll, a roll, a roll, a sausage roll, a sausage roll. We should all be as yellow as frogs if it wasn't for the makeup. All this is rank treason to the cause. I suffer as much as any of you. I loathe the repulsive thing. I can't contemplate it without a shudder. But I'm a conscientious conspirator. And if you won't give the sign, I will. Mm. Poor mm. Martyr. Mm. He's always at it. Mm. And it's a wonder where he puts mm. it. Mm. Well, now, about Troilus and Cressida. Mm. What do you play? Uh, if you'll be so obliging as to wait until I've got rid of this feeling of warm oil at the bottom of my throat, I'll tell you all about it. Oh, thank you, my love. It's gone. Well, the piece will be produced upon a scale of unexampled magnificence. It is confidently predicted that my appearance as King Agamemnon in a Louis XIV wig will mark an epoch in the theatrical annals of Pennig Halfpennig. I endeavoured to persuade Ernest Dumkoff, our manager, to lend us the classical dresses for our marriage. Think of the effect of a real Athenian wedding procession cavorting through the streets of Speisersal, torches burning, cymbals banging, flutes tootling, cinnery twanging, and a throng of fifty lovely Spartan virgins capering before us all down the high street singing. <laughs> And he declined? He did, on the prosaic ground that it might rain and the ancient Greeks didn't carry umbrellas. If, as is confidently expected, Ernest Dumkopf is elected to succeed the dethroned one, mark my words, he will make a mess of it. He's sure to be elected. His entire company has promised to plump for him on the understanding that all the places about the court are filled by members of his troop, according to professional precedents. Here comes Ernest Dumkopf. Now we shall know all about it. Well, what's, what's the news? How is the election going? Oh, it's a certainty, a practical certainty. Two of the candidates have been arrested for debt, and the third is a baby in arms. So if you keep your promises and vote solid, I'm cocksure of election. Trust to us. But you remember the conditions. Yes, all of you shall be provided for, for life. Every man shall be ennobled, every lady shall have unlimited credit at the court milliners, and all salaries shall be paid weekly in advance. Oh, it's quite clear he knows how to rule a grand duchy. Rule a grand duchy? Why, my good girl, for ten years past I've ruled a theatrical company. A man who can do that can rule anything. <laughs> A king in very truth And had a son, a guileless youth In probable succession 
to teach him patience, teach him tact, how promptly in a fix to act, he should adopt in point of fact a manager's profession. To that condition he should stoop, despite a too fond mother, with eight or ten stars in his troop, all jealous of each other, all jealous of each other. Oh, the man can rule a theatrical crew, each member a genius and some of them too, and manage to humor them little and great, can govern this tavern estate. <laughs> So slight, they say they'll be all right at night. They both to go to school yet. See, the act must change her dress. He will attempt to square the press. He won't play Romeo unless his grandmother plays Juliet. Death claims all hoydens as her right. She played them thirty seasons, and she must show herself in tights for two convincing reasons. Two very well shaped. Oh, the man who can drive a theatrical team With wheelers and leaders in order to Can govern a room with a wave of his fin All Europe with islands thrown in The man who can drive a theatrical team by my fellow conspirators to be Grand Duke of Fenig, Halb Fenig. As soon as the contemptible little occupant of the historical throne is deposed, here is promotion indeed. Why, instead of playing Troilus of Troy for a month, I shall play Grand Duke of Fenig, Halb Fenig for a lifetime. Yet, am I happy? No, far from happy. The lovely English comedian, the beautiful Julia, whose dramatic ability is so overwhelming that our audiences forgive even her strong English accent. That rare and radiant being treats my respectful advances with disdain unutterable. And yet, who knows, she is haughty and ambitious, and it may be that the splendid change in my fortunes may work a corresponding change in her feelings towards me. If so... She is here. Herr Dummkopf, a word with you, if you please. Beautiful English maiden. Oh, no compliments, I beg. I desire to speak with you on a purely professional matter, so we will, if you please, dispense with allusions to my personal appearance, which can only tend to widen the breach which already exists between us. My only hope shattered. The haughty Londoner still despises me. It shall be as you will. I understand that the conspiracy in which we are all concerned is to develop tomorrow and that the company is likely to elect you to the throne on the understanding that the posts about the court are to be filled by members of your theatrical troupe according to their professional importance. That is so. Then all I can say is that it places me in an extremely awkward position. <sighs> I don't see how it concerns you. Why, bless my heart, don't you see that as your leading lady, I am bound under a serious penalty to play the leading part in all your productions? Well? Why, of course, the leading part in this production will be the Grand Duchess. My wife! That is another way of expressing the same idea. I scarcely dared even to hope for this. Of course, as your leading lady, you'll be mean enough to hold me to the terms of my agreement. Oh, that's so like a man. Well, I suppose there's no help for it. I shall have to do it. She's mine. But do you really think you would care to play that part? Care to play it? Certainly not. But what am I to do? Business is business, and I am bound by the terms of my agreement. It's for a long run, mind. A run that may last many, many years. No understudy. And once embarked upon, there's no throwing it up. Oh, we're used to these long runs in England. They're the curse of the stage. But you see, I've no option. 
Do you think the part of Grand Duchess will be good enough for you? Oh, I think so. It's a very good part in Gerolstein, and oughtn't to be a bad one in Fennig Hab Fennig. Why, what did you suppose I was going to play? But considering your strong personal dislike to me, and your persistent rejection of my repeated offers, won't you find it difficult to throw yourself into the part with all the impassioned enthusiasm that the character seems to demand? Remember, it's a strongly emotional part, involving long and repeated scenes of rapture, tenderness, adoration, devotion, all in luxuriant excess, and all of the most demonstrative description. My good sir, throughout my career, I have made it a rule never to allow private feeling to interfere with my professional duties. You may be quite sure that... However distasteful the part may be, if I undertake it, I shall consider myself professionally bound to throw myself into it with all the ardor at my command. I'm the happiest fellow alive. Now, would you have any objection to, to give me some idea, if it's only a mere sketch, as to how you would play it? It would be really interesting to me uh, to know your conception of, of the part of my wife. How would I play it? Now let me see. Let me see. Ah, I have it. How would I play this part? The Grand Duke's bride. All rank on in my heart. I'd do to defy detection That's how I'd play this part The Grand Duke's bride With many a winsome smile I'd witch and woo With gay and girlish guile I'd frenzy you I'd madden you with my caressing Like turtle that it was more than what you would be missing With so much wind so wild I'd witch and woo Did any other maid with you succeed? I'd pinch the forward jade I would indeed With jealous frenzy agitated Which would of course be simulated I'd make a wish it never been created. I'd make a wish it never been created. I'd make a wish it never been created. Did any other meet with you succeed? And should there come to me some summer's ends in all the childish glee?
and Duke elect, I bid you speak. Ten minutes since I met a chap who bowed an easy salutation. Thinks I, the gentleman, may have belongs to our association. But on the whole, uncertain, yet a sausage roll I took and it. That chap replied, I don't embellish my eating free with obvious relish. Gracious, 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 Let him know our plot, each incident explaining That stranger chuckled much as though he thought me highly entertaining I told him all, both bad and good I bade him call, he said he would I added much the more, I muckled the more That chuckling chummy chuckle Oh, that could see, could see, could see, could see Applause down dropped he with hysteric bellow And that seemed right enough Because I am a devilish funny fellow Then suddenly as still he squealed It flashed on me that I'd revealed Our plot with all details Effective to Grand Duke Rudolph's own detect A funny thing to go and tell A funny thing to go and tell mess you've got us into and there's an end of our precious plot all up pop fizzle bang done for yes but <laughs> fancy my choosing the grand duke's private detective of all men to make a confidant of when you come to think of it it's really devilish funny <laughs> when you come to think of it it's extremely injudicious to admit into a conspiracy every pudding-headed baboon who presents himself. Yes, I should never do that. If I were chairman of this gang, I should hesitate to enroll any baboon who couldn't produce satisfactory credentials from his last zoological gardens. Ludwig, he's far from being a baboon. Poor boy, he could not help giving us away. It's his trusting nature. He was deceived. His trusting nature. Oh, I should like to talk to you in my own language for five minutes. Only five minutes. I know some good, strong, energetic English remarks that will shrivel your trusting nature into raisins. Only you wouldn't understand them. Here we perceive one of the disadvantages of a neglected education. And I suppose you'll never be my Grand Duchess now. Grand Duchess? My good friend, if you don't produce the piece, how can I play the part? True. You see what you've done. But, my dear sir, you don't seem to understand that the man ate three sausage rolls. Keep that fact steadily before you. Three large sausage rolls. Ah, lots of people eat sausage rolls who are not conspirators. Then they shouldn't. It's bad form. It's not the game. When one of the human family proposes to eat a sausage roll, it is his duty to ask himself, am I a conspirator? And if, on examination, he finds that he is not a conspirator, he is bound in honour to select some other form of refreshment. Of course he is. One should always play the game. <laughs> what are you grinning at, you greedy old man? <laughs> oh, nothing. Don't mind me. It is always amusing to the legal mind to see a parcel of laymen bothering themselves about a matter which, to a trained lawyer, presents no difficulty whatever. No, no difficulty? difficulty? None whatever. The way out of it is quite simple. Simple? simple? Certainly. Now, attend. In the first place, you two men fight a statutory duel. A statutory duel? A statutory -ta duel? Ah, oh, what a cracked your language this German is. Never heard of such a thing. It is true that the practice has fallen into abeyance through disuse. 
But all the laws of Pfennig, Halbpfennig run for a hundred years when they die a natural death, unless, in the meantime, they have been revived for another century. The act that institutes the statutory duel was passed a hundred years ago, and as it has never been revived, it expires tomorrow. So you're just in time. But what is the use of talking to us about statutory duels when we none of us know what a statutory duel is? Don't you? Then I'll explain. About a century since, the code of the duello, to sudden death for want of breath sent many a strapping fellow, the then presiding prince, who useless bloodshed hated, he passed an act short and compact, which may be briefly stated. Unlike the complicated laws of parliamentary draftsman laws, it may be briefly stated. We know the complicated laws of parliamentary draftsman laws cannot be briefly stated. By this ingenious law, if any two shall quarrel, they may not fight with falchions bright, which seem to him immoral. But each a card shall draw, and he who draws the lowest shall so to a set be thence or dead, in fact a legal goest. When excellent jokes of rhyme card bells, or photography for ghosts are spells, and ghosts is written the west. With what an emphasis he dwells upon orthography and spells that kind of fun's the lowest. When off the news has popped by pleasing legal fiction, and friend and foe have wept the woe in counter her feet affliction, the winner must adopt the loser's poor relations, discharge his debts, pay all his bets, and take his obligations. The winner must adopt the loser's poor relations, discharge his debts, pay all his bets, discharge his debts, pay all his bets, and take his obligations. In short, to briefly sum the case, the winner takes the loser's place with all its obligations. How neatly lawyers state the case, the winner takes the loser's place with all its obligations. How neatly lawyers state the case, the winner takes the loser's place. How neatly lawyers state the case, the winner takes the loser's place with all its obligations. I see. The man who draws the lowest card... ...dies ipso facto a social death. He loses all his civil rights, his identity disappears, the revising barrister expunges his name from the list of voters, and the winner takes his place, whatever it may be, discharges all his functions and adopts all his responsibilities. This is all very well as far as it goes, but it only protects one of us. What's to become of the survivor? Yes, that's an interesting point, because I might be the survivor. The survivor goes at once to the Grand Duke and, in a burst of remorse, denounces the dead man as the moving spirit of the plot. He is accepted as King's evidence and, as a matter of course, receives a free pardon. Tomorrow, when the law expires, the dead man will, ipso facto, come to life again. The revising barrister will restore his name to the list of voters, and he will resume all his obligations as though nothing unusual had happened. When he will be at once arrested, tried, and executed on the evidence of the informer. Candidly, my friend, I don't think much of your plot. Oh, dear, 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 the ignorance of the laity. My good young lady, it is a beautiful maxim of our glorious constitution that a man can only die once. Death expunges crime, and when he comes to life again, it will be with a clean slate. It's really very ingenious. My dear sir, we owe you our lives. May I kiss him? Certainly not. You're a big girl now. Well, miscreant, are you prepared to meet me on the field of honor? At once! By Jove, what a couple of fire-eaters we are. Ludwig doesn't know what fear is. Oh, I don't mind this sort of duel. It's not like a duel with swords. I hate a duel with swords. It's not the blade I mind. It's the blood. And I hate a duel with pistols. It's not the ball I mind. It's the bang. 
Altogether, it is a great improvement on the old method of giving satisfaction. Strange the view some people hold to Both these maids may keep their truth and 
Never misfortune them befall. I'd hold them as trustee for both. He'll hold them both, he'll hold them both. Yes, he'll hold them both. Sing up, stop, stand and spit and blow. Sing up, stop, stand and spit and blow. By George, the king has sought to see this note. Formality consistent with economy. Above all other virtues, I particularly prize. I never join in merriment. I don't see joke or japony. I never tolerate familiarity in shapeny. This join with an extravagant respect for tuppence halfpenny. A keynote to my character sufficiently supplies. Observe my snuff box. Mathematical. Instead of beer, a penny each. My orders are emphatical. Extravagance unpardonable. Any more than that, I call. But on the other hand, my ducal dignity to keep. No courtly ceremonial. To put it comprehensively, I rigidly insist upon. But not, I hope, offensively. Whenever ceremonial can be practiced inexpensively. And when you come to think of it, it's really very cheap. Observe my handkerchief. 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 It's sometimes inconvenient, but it's always 
fericit. My Lord Chamberlain, as you are aware, my marriage with the wealthy Baroness von Krakenfeld will take place tomorrow, and you will be good enough to see that the rejoicings are on a scale of unusual liberality. Pass that on. Unusual liberality. Unusual liberality. The sports will begin with a wedding breakfast bee. The leading pastry cooks of the town will be invited to compete, and the winner will not only enjoy the satisfaction of seeing his breakfast devoured by the Grand Ducal pair, but he will also be entitled to have the arms of Fennig Hout Fennig tattooed between his shoulder blades. The Vice Chamberlain will see to this. All the public fountains of Speisesaal will run with ginger beer heim and currant vine milch at the public expense. The assistant vice chamberlain will see to this. At night, everybody will illuminate. And as I have no desire to tax the public funds unduly, this will be done at the inhabitants' private expense. The deputy assistant vice chamberlain will see to this. All my grand ducal subjects will wear new clothes, and the sub deputy assistant vice chamberlain will collect the usual commission on all sales. Wedding presents, which on this occasion should be on a scale of extraordinary magnificence, will be received at the palace at any hour of the 24. And the temporary sub-deputy assistant vice chamberlain will sit up all night for this purpose. The entire population will be commanded to enjoy themselves. And with this view, the acting temporary sub-deputy assistant vice chamberlain will sing comic songs in the marketplace from noon to nightfall. Finally, we have composed a wedding anthem with which the entire population are required to provide themselves. It can be obtained from our Grand Ducal publishers at the usual discount price, and all the chamberlains will be expected to push the sale. <laughs> I don't feel at all comfortable. I hope I'm not doing a foolish thing in getting married. After all, it's a poor heart that never rejoices. And this wedding of mine is the first little treat I've allowed myself since my christening. <laughs> Besides, Caroline's income is very considerable. And as her ideas of economy are quite on a par with mine, it ought to turn out well. Bless her tough old heart. She's a mean little darling. Oh, here she is, punctual to her appointment. Rudolph, why, what's the matter? Why, I'm not quite myself, my pet. I'm a little worried and upset. I want a tonic. It's the low diet, I think. I, I'm afraid, after all, I shall have to take the bull by the horns and have an egg with my breakfast. I shouldn't do anything rash, dear. Begin with a jujube. <gasps> no, I'll keep it for supper. Mm. Rudolph, don't! What mm. in the world are you thinking of? I was thinking of embracing you, my sugar plum. Just as a little cheap treat. What, here? In public? Really? You appear to have no sense of delicacy. No sense of delicacy, Bombo? No, I can't make you out. When you courted me, all your courting was done publicly in the marketplace. When you proposed to me, you proposed in the marketplace. And now that we're engaged, you seem to desire that our first tete-a-tete uh, -tete shall occur in the marketplace. Surely you've a room in your palace? With blinds, that would do. But to my own, I can't help myself. I'm bound by my own decree. Your own decree? Yes. You see, all the houses that give on the marketplace belong to me. But the drains, 
which date back to the reign of Charlemagne, want attending to, and the houses wouldn't let. So with a view of increasing the value of the property, I decreed that all love episodes between affectionate couples should take place in public on this spot every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday uh, when the band doesn't play. Bless me, what a happy idea. So moral, too. And uh, have you found it answer? Answer? <laughs> the rents have gone up 50%, and the sale of opera glasses, which is a grand ducal monopoly, has received an extraordinary stimulus. So, under the circumstances, would you allow me to put my arm round your waist uh, as a source of income? Just... Once? But it's so very embarrassing. Think of the opera glasses. Well, my good girl, that's just what I am thinking of. Hang it all. We must give them something for their money. What's that? It's a letter which your detective asked me to hand to you. I wrapped it up in yesterday's paper to keep it clean. Oh, it's only his report that'll keep. But I say, you've never been and bought a newspaper. My dear Rudolph, do you think I'm mad? It came wrapped round my breakfast. Oh, I thought you were not the sort of girl to go and buy a newspaper. Well, as we've got it, we may as well read it. What does it say? Why, dear me, here's your biography. Our detested despot. Yes, I fancy that refers to me. And it says... Oh, it can't be. What can't be? Why, it says that although you're going to marry me tomorrow, you were betrothed in infancy to the Princess of Monte Carlo. Oh, yes, that's quite right. Didn't I mention it? Mention it? You never said a word about it. Oh, well, it doesn't matter, because, you see, it's practically off. Practically off? Yes. By the terms of the contract, the betrothal is void unless the princess marries before she is of age. Now, her father, the prince, is stony broke and hasn't left his house for years for fear of arrest. Over and over again, he has implored me to come to him to be married, but in vain. Over and over again, he has implored me to advance him the money to enable the princess to come to me, but in vain. I am very young, but not as young as that. And as the princess comes of age at two tomorrow, why, at two tomorrow, I'm a free man. So I appointed that hour for our wedding, as I shall like to have as much marriage as I can get for my money. I see. Of course, if the married state is a happy state, it's a pity to waste any of it. Why, every hour we delayed, I should lose a lot of you, and you'd lose a lot of me. My thoughtful darling. Oh, Rudolph, we ought to be very happy. If I'm not, it'll be my first bad investment. Still, there is such a thing as a slump, even in matrimonial. I often picture us in the long, cold, dark December evenings, sitting close to each other and singing impassioned duets to keep us warm and thinking of all the lovely things we could afford to buy if we chose and at the same time planning out our lives in a spirit of the most rigid and exacting economy. Oh. It's a most beautiful and touching picture of connubial bliss in its highest and most rarefied development. <laughs> As all a penny rule we sing, it is not reprehensive to think what joys our wealth would bring. Were we disposed to do the thing upon a scale extensive? This rich spot turtle, thick and clear, perhaps we'll have it once a year. <laughs> Open-handed, dear. Oh, mind you, it's expensive. No doubt it is expensive. How oh, fleeting are the glutton's joys. With fish and fowl he lightly toys. And pays for such expensive drinks, sometimes as much as two and six. As two and six. As two and six. Sometimes as much as two and six. 
It gives them no advantage, mind. For you and they have only died. And you remain when one sits down a better man by half a crown. By half a crown? By half a crown. Yes, two and six is half a crown. Then let us be modest and merry and rejoice with the dead in our very. For to laugh and to sing no extravagant spring is a joy economical fairy. Then let us be modest and merry and rejoice with the dead in our very. For to laugh and to sing no extravagant spring is a joy economical fairy. Try to hide it. I moisten my insipid fare with water, which I can't abear. No, I, I can't abide it. This pleasing fact our souls will cheer with fifty thousand pounds a year. We could indulge in table beer. Get out. We could. I've tried it. Yes, yes, of course you've tried it. Who oh, he who has an income clear of fifty thousand pounds a year? Speak your thoughts. Two shilling gloves. Two shilling gloves. Two shilling gloves. Yes, think of that. Two shilling gloves. Cheap shoes and ties of gaudy hue. And water berry watches too. And think that he could buy the lot were he a donkey. Which he's not. Oh, no, he's not. Oh, no, he's not. That, That kind, kind of donkey he is not. Then let us be modestly merry and rejoice with the dairy not very. For to love and to sing is a rational thing. It's a true economical fairy. Then let us be modestly merry and rejoice with the dairy not very. For to love and to sing is a rational thing. It's a true economical fairy. For my detective's report. What's this? Another conspiracy? A conspiracy to depose me? And my private detective was so convulsed with laughter at the notion of a conspirator selecting him for a confidant that he was physically unable to arrest the malefactor. Why? It'll come off. This comes of engaging a detective with a keen sense of the ridiculous. For the future, I'll employ none but Scotchmen. And the plot is to explode tomorrow? My wedding day? Oh, Caroline. Caroline. <laughs> This is perfectly frightful. What's to be done? I don't know. I ought to keep cool and think. But you can't think when your veins are full of hot soda water and your brain's fizzing like a firework and all your faculties are jumbled in a perfect whirlpool of publication. Oh, and I'm going to be ill. I know I am. I've been living too low. And I'm going to be very ill indeed. Indeed. When you find you're a broken down critter Who is all of a tremble and twitter With your palate unpleasantly bitter As if you've just eaten a pill 
when your legs are as thin as dividers and you're plagued with unruly insiders and your spine is all creepy with spiders and you're highly gambooge in the gill. Creepy. Creepy. When you've got a beehive in your head and a sewing machine in each ear and you feel that you eat in your bed and you've got a bad headache a headache down here when such facts are about and those symptoms you find in your body all crown well you better look out you may make up your mind you had better Smeary like tallow, and your tongue is decidedly yellow. With a pint of warm oil in your swallow, and a pound of tin tacks in your chest. When you're down in the mouth with the vapors, and all over your body small papers. Black beetles are cutting their capers, and crawly things never let rest. Crawly things, crawly things. <laughs> when you doubt if your head is your own, and you jump when an open door slams, ah! then you've got to a state, to a state which is known to the medical world as Jim Jams. If such symptoms you find in your body or head, they're not easy to well. You may make up your mind you are better in bed for you. for my confession and full pardon. They told me the Grand Duke was dancing duets in the marketplace, but I don't see him. Hello, who's this? Why, it is the Grand Duke. <laughs> who are you, sir, who presume to address me in person? If you've anything to communicate, you must fling yourself at the feet of my acting temporary sub-deputy assistant, Vice-Chamberlain, who will fling himself at the feet of his immediate superior, and so on with successive foot-flingings through the various grades. Your communication will, in course of time, come to my august knowledge. But when I inform your highness that in me you see the most unhappy, the most unfortunate, the most completely miserable man in your whole dominion. Oh, you, the most miserable man in my whole dominion? How can you have the face to stand there and say such a thing? Why, look at me. Look at me! <laughs> Well, I wouldn't be a crybaby. A crybaby? If you had just been told that you were going to be deposed tomorrow and perhaps blown up with dynamite for all I know, wouldn't you be a crybaby? I do declare if I could only hit upon some cheap and painless method of putting an end to an existence which has become insupportable, I would unhesitatingly adopt it. You would? <laughs> I see a magnificent way out of this. By Jupiter, I'll try it. Are you by any chance in earnest? In earnest? Why, look at me! If you are really in earnest, if you really desire to escape scot-free from this impending, this unspeakably horrible catastrophe, without trouble, danger, pain, or expense, why not resort to a statutory duel? A statutory duel? Yes. The act is still in force but it will expire tomorrow afternoon. You fight, you lose, you are dead for a day. 
Tomorrow, when the act expires, you will come to life again and resume your grand duchy as though nothing had happened. In the meantime, the explosion will have taken place and the survivor will have had to bear the brunt of it. Yes, uh, that's all very well. But who will be fool enough to be the survivor? Actuated by an overwhelming sense of attachment to your grand ducal person, I unhesitatingly offer myself as the victim of your subject's fury. You do? Well, really, that's very handsome. I dare say being blown up is not nearly as unpleasant as one would think. Oh, yes, it is. It mixes one up awfully. But suppose I were to lose. Oh, that's easily arranged. I'll put an ace up my sleeve. You'll put a king up yours. When the drawing takes place, I shall seem to draw the higher card and you the lower. And there you are. Oh, but, but that's cheating. So it is. I never thought of that. Not that I mind, but I say, you won't take an unfair advantage of your day of office. You won't go tipping people or squandering my little savings in fireworks or any nonsense of that sort. I am hurt, really hurt by the suggestion. You, you wouldn't like to put down a deposit, perhaps? No, I don't think I should like to put down a deposit. Or give a guarantee? A guarantee would be equally open to objection. It would be more regular. Oh, very well. I, I suppose you must have your own way. Good. I say we must have a devil of a quarrel. Oh, a devil of a quarrel. Just to give colour to the thing. Shall I give you a sound thrashing before all the people? Say the word. Oh, it's no <laughs> trouble. No, no, I, I think not. Uh, though it would be very convincing, and it's extremely good and thoughtful of you to suggest it. Still, a devil of a quarrel. Oh, a devil of a quarrel. No, no half measures. Big words, strong language, rude remarks. Oh, a devil of a quarrel. And now the question is, how shall we summon the people? Oh, there's no difficulty about that. Bless your heart. They've been staring at us through those windows for the last half hour. All you people, when you hear the fearful news All the pretty women weep hope men will shiver in their shoes And they'll all cry, no defend us When they learn the fact tremendous That to give this man his gruel In a statutory duel This plebeian man of shoddy This contemptible nobody Your grand duke does not refuse Now you begin and bid it strong, walk into me abusively. I've several epithets that I've reserved for you exclusively. A choice selection I have here when you are ready to begin. No, you 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 begin. Bombs, small bombs, great guns and little ones Put him in a pillory, wreck him with artillery Long swords, short swords, tough swords and brittle ones Fight him into bits, love him into bits You mouth, sir, you loud, sir, enough, sir You don't, sir, a hit, sir, dig head, sir His tits are for dead, sir, his tits are for dead, sir His tits are for dead, sir His tits are for dead, sir Small snobs, rich snobs, and needy ones. Who are you alluding to? Where well, are you intruding to? Fat snobs, thin snobs, swell snobs, and seedy ones. I'd rather think you are. To whom do you refer? To you, sir. To me, sir. I do, sir. You see, sir. A dear, sir. Great face, sir. Look here, sir. A face, sir. It's it's a tits of a dancer. It's tits of a dancer. It's tits of a Insult, he has insulted and in a breath 
is day we fight a duel to the death. And you mean, of course, by duel, a verbum set, a statutory duel. Verbum set! According to established legal uses, a card apiece each bull dispute chooses. Dead as a doornail is the dog who loses. The winner steps into the dead man's shoes. Dead as a doornail is the dog who loses. The winner steps into the dead man's shoes. Agreed, agreed, agreed. Come, come, the pack. Behold it here. I'm on the rack. I quick with fear. Must go to you. If that's the case, behold the king. Behold the ace. Yes, yes, I'll come to life tomorrow. My Lord Grand Duke, farewell, a pleasant journey, Mary, to your convenient selling yonder cemetery. The bare contents abuse you. We're much distressed to lose you. You were when you were living, so liberal, so forgiving, so merciful, so gentle, so highly ornamental. And now that you've departed, you leave us broken-hearted. Yes, truly, truly. Can put all his friends in conspicuous places with plenty to eat and with nothing to pay. You'll tell me no doubt with unpleasant grimaces. Tomorrow, deprived of your ribbons and laces, you'll get your dismissal with very long faces. But wait on that topic, I've something to say. I've something to say. I've something to say. I've something to say. Oh, our rule 
shall be merry. I'm not an ascetic, and while the sun shines, we will get up our hay by a pushing young monarch of turn energetic. A very great deal may be done in a day. His ancestor drew it, this law against duels, tomorrow will die. The duel will revive and you'll certainly rue it. He'll give you what for and he'll let you know why. But in 24 hours there's time to renew it. With a century's life I've the right to imbue it. It's easy to do and by jingo I'll do it. It's done till I perish. Your monarch am I, your monarch am I, your monarch am I. <laughs> Do not pretend to be very prophetic. I fancy I know what you're going to say. By a pushing young man, the cop turn energetic. A very great deal may be done in a day. This very afternoon at two about. The court appointments will be given out to each and all, for that was the condition according to professional position. Hurrah! Hurrah! Uh-huh. What's the matter? According to professional position. According to professional position. Then the
The lady is right. The lady's right. Though Julia's engagement was for the stagement, it certainly frees Ludwig from his connubial promise. The marriage contracts, or whatever you call them, are very solemn. Dramatic contracts which you all adore so are even more so. That's very true. The marriage contracts are very solemn. Dramatic contracts are even more so. We'll not touch upon Let us begin As we are going on We call for little and for big See, baby, you'll be just a friend of your family Come on tonight, our life you'll be as merry as a grig See, baby, you'll be just a friend of your family All state and savvy money will eternally abolish We don't mean to insist upon unnecessary polish And on the whole, I'd rather think you'll find our own for lovish See, baby, you'll be just a friend of your family Jolly Jolly Jinx, Jolly Jolly Jinx, Jolly Jolly Jinx, Jolly 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 Jinx. For this will be a jolly call for little and for big. Sing me the jolly jinx of any fun thing. Be as ready as a Greek. See, baby, Johnny, just a friend of your family. Say, baby, Johnny, just a friend of your family. Say, baby, Johnny, just a friend of your family. Say, baby, Johnny, just a friend of your family. Say, baby, Johnny, just a fri